Shabbat Shalom, may be seated. If you have your chumash there, you can hold on to it because we're going to be referring to this double part of the Tzavim and Vayelech uh, and how it's even positioned, why the rabbis wanted to position it so it would definitely fall out before or during or before end during the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur season. Because sometimes Nitzavim will be right before and Vayelech will be in between on Shabbat Shuvah or it'll be Nitzavim Vayelech before. But it'll always be during this high holiday season. So the very first verse of Deuteronomy 29, 13 through 14, at the very beginning of our Parsha, or close to it, let's see, let's find the page. Devarim 29. So in the very early part of the Parsha, we have the verse that says, but not only with you am I making this covenant. So I'm not making it just with you who's standing in front of me, God says, but with those standing with us today before the Lord, our God, and with those who are not here with us this day. So what he's done in this verse, who's the covenant with? It's those who were before you, you, and those after you. So it's a commitment, a covenant that goes not just with this generation, but with the next generation. It's a very simple statement, with those who are not here with us this day, which refers both to those who brought them to this moment, that they're standing here, those who are no longer with them, and those who are not here today because they're not yet born. So in a very almost sleight of hand way, the Torah says that this covenant is binding upon all future generations. And we accept it, right? Simple statement. But the question is, how do you do that? How does one generation bind the next generation to the covenant? Where do they get the power to do that? Where do they get the right to do that? And what it points to is the problem of every religion, every culture, uh, every country, whatever it might be, as to how you transmit that religion, that culture, that ideology to the next generation. And every culture, every country, every religion is obsessed with that idea. How do you do it? So you develop educational programs, uh, you develop, or in some cases, controls that prevent the people from being exposed to anything else that might lead them astray. Uh, every method you can think of, we think of our own Jewish community, it's our main concern. How do we create a next generation that has a commitment? Their commitment, how they act out, that commitment may be different, but the commitment's there. So we focus on schools, camps, trips to Israel, uh, synagogues, whatever it might be, and most of our energies is directed towards that, how to transmit the tradition. So Deuteronomy, as the covenant is being entered into, has that as its main concern. How do you transmit it? Do you have a right to bind that next generation to that covenant, to that way of life, to those beliefs? The Torah already is concerned with that with Abraham. Right? How is Abraham going to transmit this new idea that he's developed to the next generation? And by the way, when you look at Genesis, Abraham has two children, right? Isaac and Ishmael. And only one of them continues in the tradition. Isaac has two children, Jacob and Esau. And only one of them continues in the tradition. 50%, that's it. Not a very good record. In other words, it already shows us in the beginning of our history, there's a real struggle how to hold on to that next generation. And Abraham and Isaac, they get 50%. And it's pretty good. Then we get to Jacob, who blows up his whole family completely, in which they're trying to kill each other, selling one into slavery. 
But at the end of his life, somehow they're all united and they're standing at his deathbed and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. So he succeeded to transmit it to the next generation that commits the people of Israel. So that's why we are B'nai Yisrael. We're the children of Jacob, children of Israel, and we're not the children of Abraham and Isaac because 50% won't cut it. <laughs> it's not enough. Only Jacob succeeded, so we have to be like Jacob and transmit it. It also addresses the question and answers it, as, as I understand it, as why circumcision was moved from everyone in that culture. Remember, everybody circumcised in the Middle East. It was not a new idea whatsoever. And we know it's not a new idea because when God says to Abraham, I want you to circumcise yourself and circumcise your son, he doesn't say, what's that? He knows exactly what it is because it's part of the culture of the ancient Near East. Uh, the Philistines, who were invaders, right, they came, they were sea peoples, they invaded the land of Canaan, and they took over the Gaza Strip, and they dwelled there. They were referred to as the uncircumcised ones, right? It was kind of like an insult. The uncircumcised ones, meaning, isn't this such a strange people? What are you doing here? You're not part of this culture. So circumcision is well known. However, the Torah makes a dramatic decision to shift it from puberty 12, 13, whatever it is, down to the eighth day. Why does it do that? Why does it shift it down to the eighth day? Because it decides to interpret that ancient Near Eastern custom as transmission of the covenant, a sign of the covenant between God and the people of Israel, not an entry into puberty. So why does the Torah do this? Because the Torah's biggest problem is exactly what we saw here. How do you transmit that tradition to the next generation? How do you have, give the idea that you have to transmit the tradition? That in fact, that generation is born into the tradition. They don't have to opt in, they have to opt out. They are already in, they would have to opt out. How do you do that? So what they did was they took circumcision and said this is the sign of the covenant. So they take the sign of the covenant they put it on the organ of regeneration, and they transmit the covenant into the next generation. It's very graphic. It's very obvious. And therefore, the child is born of the covenant because the covenant has been transmitted right into the womb. So that's the reason they, they change circumcision, because they are trying to figure out how to transmit it. So you start off with circumcision. Say you were, if it wasn't... For the, for the covenant, you wouldn't have been born, period. You're born into the covenant. Now, we'll try and teach you what that covenant is, and hopefully you'll stay attached to the covenant. You may opt out. But even in Jewish law, even if you opt out, you're still in. Right? Even if you opt out, you're still in. You can never leave. You may not participate and not identify yourself, but you're still in. So the Torah was working throughout all, from the book of Genesis right to these last verses, on how to transmit that tradition, not to transmit it, but how to say that you are part of that covenant, born into that covenant. And then it had asked the question, well, what if you're not born into it? Can you opt in? And of course, that's taken care of at Mount Sinai, where anyone who accepts the Torah is in. So we have the covenant at Mount Sinai. Anyone who accepts the Torah is in. You transmit that through circumcision, and when they entered the land of Israel, they said this is permanent. This is from now throughout eternity, from one generation to the next. The next question is, why were the rabbis so determined to have this Torah reading during the high holiday period? And that leads to another question. Why do we start reading the Torah the beginning, the book of Genesis, after the holiday Sukkot, right? Sukkot ends, and then we have Simchas Torah. Simchas Torah has nothing to do with Sukkot. It's not in the Torah. It's not even an early Mishnahic period. It's when we started the custom of reading the Torah systematically, beginning with Genesis, getting to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and celebrating that siyum, that completion. Why did they choose at the end of Sukkot? Now, it's obvious to us because that's how we do it, but think of the options. What is the first month of the year? 
It's not Tishrei. We're not in the first month of the year. We're in the seventh month of the year. This is the new year for who? For the world. This is not our new year. This is the new year for the world. Yom Harat Olam. Not Yom Harat Am Yisrael. This is not the birthday of the people of Israel. This is the birthday of the world. And we're part of the world, so we commemorate it. But it's the seventh month. So what's our first month? It's Nisan, when we left Egypt. Why don't we start reading the Torah on the first month of the Jewish year? Wouldn't that make more sense? Or even, even better, when do we get the Torah? We got the Torah on Shavuot. Why don't we start the book of Genesis the week after Shavuot? I got the Torah, right, it's a gift. Now I'm going to start reading it. I'm going to study it. It makes perfect sense. The one thing that doesn't make perfect sense is to read it in the seventh month of the year. Why'd they do that? Now, they did it consciously because there was no tradition. It wasn't like we have an ancient tradition that says we have to read the Torah beginning after Sukkot because there was no reading of the Torah. It didn't exist in the Bible in the early biblical period. It exists in the diaspora. It's created by the diaspora in order to keep the Torah alive and very much part of our lives. So why did they make that choice? So I want to look carefully at the following verses. Um, it's Deuteronomy 36, 30, verse 6, I believe. But I'll, I'll read them out loud. They saw something in this text that said, this is Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. This is what Rosh Hashanah is all about. And the text goes like this. And it will be when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you that you will consider in your heart among all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. So what are they talking about here? We're banished. What is banishment? It's exile. So this is the theme of exile. Now there's two types of exile. There's the exile of the nation, something very real. We lived in the land of Israel. The temple was destroyed. We were exiled to Babylonia. All right, then we return. The temple is destroyed a second time by the Romans. And this time the exile lasts for 2,000 years. We're banished. So this is talking about exile. But there's another type of exile. And that is when you banish yourself. You leave who you are and you go down a wrong path. Right? This is who I'm supposed to be, this is who I am, and I strayed. I banished myself. Then it goes on to say, and you will return to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and you will return. So what's the theme of High Holidays? Teshuvah, return. Banishment is sin, to use a very non-Jewish term, right? The better term is, right, chet, right? Al chet, shechatanu lefanecha. Chet is, in Hebrew, you shoot an arrow, and you're supposed to hit the center, and it strays off, and you miss. Machtia tamatara. I missed it. I was supposed to go this way, I went that way. So how do I get back? I return. That's why it's teshuva. So, and avera is, I had a great opportunity to do something important and good, Over, I missed it. I just passed it right over. I passed it over. So, what do you do? You know, you're on I-95 and you miss your exit. You exit the next one, and then you go this way, a left, and a left, and I return. I go back, because I missed it. So that's the whole language of the High Holidays. I missed an opportunity, or I literally, I missed the mark, and I strayed from the path. So, I went into exile. I left where I'm supposed to be. And that's exactly the language here. The Lord your God, among all the nations where the Lord your God banish you, exile, and will return to the Lord your God. Then he says later, I will make you more numerous than your forefathers, your other God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring. So the circumcision of the heart is the removal of the stubbornness, right? The heart is a seat of, uh, of emotion in the, in the Torah. Uh, and even in 
in the English language, use heart as a seat of emotion. Uh, so that you circumcise, you remove that stubbornness, and you reveal your true heart. So all this language in this Parsha is the rabbis see it as the language of sin and return, chet, tshuva, avera and tshuva, both for the individual and for the nation. So you have the ingathering of the exiles and the restoration of the covenant. So the Haftorah that Daniel chanted today was exactly that. God is restoring the covenant and the relationship between God and the people of Israel, and we're returning to the land of Israel during the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, when we restored the kingdom, built the second temple, uh, and remained there until the Romans came. So all this language for the rabbis was a sign of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and what it meant for the nation to return to itself, and what it meant for the individual to return to him or herself. So this portion seemed for the rabbis extremely appropriate. Plus it's the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And what's it talking about? Return, restoration, and rebuilding, which is exactly the theme of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. All right, we return, both symbolically and physically. People come back to the synagogue in droves. And we have restoration. We try and repair relationships. We try and fix families, broken things. Uh, and then we have the future, in which we see a brighter future, so we end with the Tekiah Gedola. So in this Parsha, you have a reflection of what Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is. That could be the reason that the rabbi said, this is a perfect way to end the year, look forward, and then when the holidays are over, let's start reading the Torah from anew. And it will inspire us. We'll work our way all the way through. We'll get to next year, and we'll correct the mistakes we made in the previous year, and the Torah will remain our guide. So this Parsha is the Parsha of the themes of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and it also reminds us that the number one obligation is to transmit that covenant from one generation to the next, and that is an extremely difficult task that one has to focus on and invest all our resources in making that true. So we've done it now for 3,500 years, and every single generation said this will be the last generation. This is, we're going to fail. We can't do it. And somehow we managed to do it. It remains our focus as a community, our focus as a, a synagogue, and it remains Israel's focus to restore the people to its land and to find out the meaning of that covenant in the 21st century. That's what they're struggling about now in Israel with all the demonstrations and all the conflict, is an attempt to make sure that what we do transmit to the next generation is true, that it's really emet, that this is really the tradition of the Torah and the tradition of the Jewish people. So it really is an existential battle in Israel as we go through an existential battle in our own country to define what it is we're going to transmit to that next generation to keep them in the tradition of the American spirit, just as every country wants to keep its next generation in the tradition of its culture and its founding principles. Shabbat Shalom.